Greetings, my name is Elias Vick, and welcome to this episode on the cloth modifier inside of 3D Studio Max. Here is an example on what you can expect to create after you watch this episode. Before we talk about this modifier, I'd like to mention that I'll be reading from the 3D Studio Max documents on some of the parameters for this modifier. This modifier is very complex and requires good knowledge about the modifier in order for you to work on something more advanced. So now that this is out of the way, let's begin. The cloth modifier helps you to simulate cloth-like effects on your models. So for example, if you're going to create a pillow, t-shirt, flag, curtains, or anything similar to that, the cloth modifier is going to be your new best friend. Before we apply the cloth modifier onto our object, it's important to understand that the cloth modifier requires many polygons in order to simulate a good result for us. So what I have done is to create a plane with many length and width segments, which will add more detail to my mesh. Alright, now let's go ahead and create a sphere. The reason to why we're creating a sphere is for our object to have something to collide with. In this case, the sphere is going to be our collision object. Alright, cool. Now that this is done, we can go ahead and apply the cloth modifier onto our object. The cloth modifier can be found in the modifiers panel and is applied to all of your models that will be a part of the cloth simulation. You can alternatively apply the cloth modifier onto your main model and then append your other models into the simulation later on. When you first take a look at the modifier, it may look very advanced, but don't worry too much about all the buttons you see in the command panel. We will first and foremost cover the object properties and gradually go into some of the more advanced things later during this video. If you press the object properties, which is the button at the top of your command panel, you will open up a new window called object properties. This is the window where you will set properties for... <laughs> I keep saying properties a lot, am I not? Either way, you will, when, you, when you open up this window, you can essentially set properties and, and um, parameters, change parameters for your model that will be a part of the cloth simulation. So depending on what you're going to be creating, you can change some settings in here, which will affect the overall look of your cloth. So what you want to do in here now, first of all, is to look to the left and select the object you want to work with. Depending on what you want to do with this object, you can set it to be inactive, which means the object will be a part of the cloth simulation, but not do anything. You can then select the cloth option. The cloth option will enable a ton of settings, making you able to change everything cloth related to the object. Right under cloth properties, you can set a property of some of the more common cloth types. As you change the preset, you can actually see the values below change accordingly to the editor's set values for that type of cloth. I believe that you already figured out you can actually save and load your own presets with the save and load buttons. Below the preset, you can actually set your own values to define your own cloth type. Here we can set the U-bend, V-bend, UB-curve, thickness, and so on. There are a lot of settings that we can go through and talk about, but I will talk about a few and then leave a link to the properties in the description. The U-bend and V-bend stands for resistance to bending. The higher the value, the less the fabric will be able to bend. Both the U-bend and V-bend parameters are locked together so that changing one will set the other to the same value. You can disable this by toggling the antistopic button below. The density defines the weight of the cloth per unit that you're using in your scene. Use smaller values to simulate a lighter cloth, for example, something like silk. Thickness defines the virtual thickness of the fabric for the purpose of detecting cloth-to-cloth -cloth collision. This value is irrelevant if you're not using the cloth-to-cloth -cloth collision. Air risk stands for air resistance, and this value determines how much the air will affect the cloth. There are more parameters that are important to know about, I just thought of naming a few. I recommend that you read the documents if you have plans on creating your own type of cloth. Alright, so now we have the keep shape parameters, which are pretty much straightforward. These settings preserve the shape of the mesh based on the values bend and stretch. In a normal operation, when the cloth tries to simulate, it tries to flatten out the cloth. Below keep shape, we have pressure, which is, in my opinion, the coolest parameters on this modifier. It allows you to set the pressure that will inflate or deflate the model. Last but not least, we have one of the more important parts of the object properties, and that is the collision object. Toggling the collision object will make sure that the cloth modifier understands that the selected object shall have a collision assigned to it. One of the more common mistakes is that you forget to set a collision object, which results in your cloth or your object just falling through space. So to summarize quickly, in the object properties, you can set properties for your models in your scene. They can either be inactive, cloth, 
or a collision object. Inactive does nothing, cloth makes your cloth into a cloth, and collision makes your object have a collision. And again, you can only have one of these active at a time. Great, now that we have an understanding of how we can set the object properties for your models, let's go ahead and talk a bit about the cloth forces. In 3D Studio Max, you can add forces such as wind, push, vortex, bombs, gravity, and so on to simulate well different forces. What the cloth forces allows you to do is to add these forces into your simulation. This will give you even more customization on top of what you already have. Next on the list is the simulation tab. I will skip this till the end of the episode when we are going to simulate something that we make. Continuing downwards, we have the selected objects manip parameters. These parameters are used to manipulate the object within your simulation a bit more to your liking, which means that you gain control over the end result of your simulation. If you run your simulation and find that you like the result of the frame 30, then you can go ahead and save that position of your object in your simulation. That can be done with the set initial state. When you set the initial state of your model, the first frame in your animation will become the initial state of that simulation. You will need to hit the erase simulation button in order to keep your initial state for the entire simulation. If you want to reset the state of your model before any simulation occurred, then you can go ahead and select the reset state button. This will set the object's position into the ones that you had before the cloth modifier was applied. The delete object cache deletes the cache for the selected non-cloth objects. If an object is simulated as a cloth, and then it turns into a collision object, or inactive, via the object properties dialog, it will then retain the cloth motion within its cache. This is useful for simulating cloths in layers. For example, you may want to simulate a character's pants, and then turn the pants into a collision object for simulating a coat. By simulating in layers, you avoid the problems of cloth-to-cloth -cloth collision detection. If you want to remove the cached motion from the selected objects, use the delete object cache. The grab state button takes a look into your modifiers list and then applies the changes that you have made on top of the cloth modifier object. The grab target state is similar to the grab state in the way of it altering your model's look. You can use the grab target state in order to keep a specific deformation shape on your cloth model. The reset target state resets the default bend angles on the mesh before the cloth modifier was then applied. Create keys. Create keys for a selected cloth object. The object is collapsed to an editable mesh and any deformation is stored as a vertex animation. Add objects lets you add objects to the simulation without opening the object properties dialog. This is really handy and useful. Below these you can toggle show current state and show target state. This will show you how the cloth looks before and after the simulation. When show enabled solid collision is toggled on, you can then see the vertices that were involved in the solid object's collisions. Below these we have a new category called selected objects. I won't be able to cover everything in here since it's out of my knowledge, but what some of these parameters will allow you to do is to assign different maps, textures, vertex colors, which will change how the cloth should behave. For example, you can make a cloth bend after a black and white texture. I will leave a link below so that you can read more about it. Last but not least, we have the simulation parameters, which lets you specify general properties of your simulation. Some of these are pretty straightforward, but I will cover some of those that I believe can be a bit hard to understand. Centimeter slash unit determines how many centimeters there are per 3D Studio Max system unit. You can read more about this in the documentation. I recommend reading about the step and subsample in the documentation as well. Earth sets the gravity value to the gravity that we have on Earth which is minus 980. You can manually then tweak the value to change the gravity on your simulation. Advanced pinching is helpful when the cloth is colliding with small features of the collision object. A good example would be fingers, small blades and such. Note that there is a performance hit for enabling this feature. 
Tension lets you visualize the tension in the fabric with vertex coloring. This is great to see the stretched cloth which is indirected by the red color. As far as I know, this only works for the garment maker objects. At the bottom we have weld which controls how the cloth is smoothed across a tear you set up before the cloth has been torn. I recommend reading about this in the documents as well. Alright, we have gone through the entire list and I believe that we have a great understanding of how the cloth modifier works. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> we are far from done. If you press the plus icon to the next, next to the cloth modifier in the command panel, you'll get four more options to choose from. These are called groups, sorry, group, panel, seams and faces. By selecting group, you will get a whole new menu with new parameters that we can change. Now this menu is almost as extensive as the last one, so I want to quickly and efficiently cover these parameters for you. As you can see, most of the parameters are unavailable to us. We can make group, which I will explain very soon. We can weld vertices, make a tear in our cloth. Below these we can copy, paste, shrink, grow and etc. All of these functions allow me to, well, shrink, ring, copy, grow the selection and things like that. When you have made a selection, you can then make a group out of that selection. By creating a group, a ton of new settings are available to us. We can now go ahead and add other objects to manipulate parts of our group. So let me go ahead and show you that now. We can of course delete and rename our group, change it to be sticky so that it sticks onto surfaces that it collides with. In here you can set presets for part of your cloth. So you can for example make one third of your cloth to be silk and the rest to be cotton. You can apply a soft selection to change how the group of your cloth should behave. So you can really manipulate and change parts of your cloth objects by selecting it in here. After group we find panel. Instead of opening the object properties, you can go into the panel from now on to change these parameters. All you have to do is to enable the panel view from the object properties. After panels we find seams, and this will only work for those using the garment maker modifier. In here you can change stiffness and strength and things that will modify how the seams will react to the cloth. Lastly we have faces, which is awesome and so much fun to play around with. What you can do is to manually select faces of your object and dragging it around in your scene to your liking. Here let me show you. All you have to do in order for this to work is to make your object into a cloth, then select simulate local and then live drag. And the same thing goes for live rotation. Cool, so that is now most, if not everything, that we covered. Alright, so let's finish off this video by creating our last piece by uh, essentially just creating a cloth object and simulating it dropping down to a sphere. Alright, so I decided to actually go back and do everything from scratch just to make sure that everyone can follow along and do exactly what I'm doing and get the similar result as I'm getting. So first of all, um, we need something to, we need a cloth object. And I'm going to use a plane to simulate uh, as my cloth piece. So I'm just going to set this length to 200, 200, and uh, 35 len length and width segments are going to be fine for this. Second of all, I want to use a sphere as my collision object, so it falls around the sphere. And I'm just going to center both of these into the center of the scene, and that will be about 
that. Before we continue on with this here, I want to show you now how you can make a garment maker because some of the functions in the cloth modifier are not able unless you use a garment maker. So what you want to do is to go to the create tab, go to shapes, and then select any of the splines here that are connected fully. So for example, a, uh, a rectangle would be perfectly fine for this. What you then do is to go into the modifier tab, modifier list, and go down until you find garment maker, where you can find that. Where, there we go. But let's forget that for the moment and continue on working on our simulation. So what I'll be doing now is to raise this cloth piece up into the air so we like it'll fall down onto the sphere. And what I'll then do is I can either select both the plane and the sphere and add the modifier, the cloth modifier on here, or I can just select one piece and then add or append the other piece onto that modifier later on, which I'm gonna do. So just select the cloth piece, in this case plane one. I'm gonna go down here and select cloth. And I can now add my collision object by pressing add objects or going into the objects properties and selecting add objects up here and then selecting the sphere and add. Now this is completed or complete. I'm going to go ahead and select the plane, which is the cloth object, set it to cloth and let's use a silk cloth piece. I'll then go ahead and select the sphere and select collision object and then press OK to save our settings. If I now go ahead and press the simulate local, the cloth will fall down onto the sphere and react to, uh, to its geometry. And it's doing that because the gravity is set to the Earth's gravity, so it's going to fall like a real piece of cloth would fall in real life. Or it's similar to that. I can't say that it's exactly 100% accurate. So simulate local, we'll do a simulation of this. And it may bug out like this. Don't worry, don't worry though. Um, in order to reset the state of this position here, just press the reset, uh, reset states. Now, the reason to why the cloth actually made this uh, weird artifact thing where it's spreading out all the polygons everywhere and all that is actually due to a, a unit problem. So my centimeters and units are not really matching up with the sphere, you could say, or in the scene overall. So that's why it's bugging out and you can't really calculate how it should flow and, and fall down onto the sphere. So it's important that you watch your units and make sure that your scene is in scale and not really mixing between realistic and not realistic values. Now, instead of battling those things, I'm going to go ahead and try the simulate local damped instead and see what we get from this thing. Simulate local damped is uh, similar to the simulate local, except that it's damped and uh, more accurate and slower, you could say. So now we have a nice cloth piece falling down onto the sphere. Now, if I want to record this process, because right now in our timeline, we have nothing saved here. So if I want to have this falling down and recording the process of that and record it into my timeline, I'll have to go ahead and uh, simulate the entire process here. And I can do that easily by just pressing simulate. The problem is though, sometimes that won't work either because the uh, uh, we'll get some errors and the cloth piece will change um, and get stuck and then the, the, the si simulation will stop. Now there are a bit of a work, some, some workarounds around this. So what we could do to, to work around this is to actually select the, the, the sphere and then just make it a bit smaller maybe. And then go back to the cloth piece again, reset state and then try again with the simulation. And you can see just because the, 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 um, the sphere was a bit too big or in a certain, <laughs> certain scale, it was just bugging out because of that. So it has some limitations and you can play around with the subsamples and self collision and things like that to sort of avoid that happening. 
But essentially, um, that's how you do a simulation and that's how you do the a rendering of this. I'm actually quite happy that we've got two problems in here so I could show you how to resolve these issues. So simulate local, we can actually try that one again. So let's erase the simulation and simulate local. It sort of works. Now you can see that we have a problem with this clipping through the entire piece here. So we can actually go ahead and reset the state. And let's go ahead and do the subsample to seven, for example. It's a bit more accurate now. So probably, maybe, yeah, it's a bit better now. You can see it's not clipping through there anymore. The next problem about this though is going to be that we have the cloth piece colliding within itself. So let me show you that right now. There we go. If you look down here, it's clipping through itself. We could try to avoid that by going down here again and select self collision and increase this up to like three. When setting self collision onto your object, uh, a value over one is not going to be necessary, but I'm going to use three here. So don't, don't really overdo it. And then try the simulate local again. But I'm not really sure if you saw that, but it's it's better now than before. One last thing, let's do a reset state and do a simulate. Let's do a simulate with no subsamples and no self collision, and it's going to be a bit quicker. Uh, reset. There we go. What we've done now is to essentially save down the entire process of this piece falling down onto a sphere. And we can play that back by play animation. And we now have this. All right, I feel like I've been talking for over an hour now. And um, yeah, I guess this is gonna be about it. If you have any questions, just put them down in the comment section below. And if you have any suggestions, put them in the comment section below or send them to me via email or uh, any on any media that you can find find me on, really. Would work perfectly fine. And um, I'm sorry about the bugs that actually appeared on here, but I think that's pretty good because you actually saw how I could tackle them and sort of work around them and sort of do things like that magic, you know. Right, thank you for watching, have a nice day, and I'll see you as soon as I can.